Let's move on to the fourth story where we view biomechanics as a global open science collaboration. I've listed some of the people involved here, but honestly, there are too many to list. I just wanted to say I am incredibly grateful to work with this talented team and others who aren't even on this list. When I finished my PhD in 1990 and took this picture to include in my dissertation, uh, notice the picture has curved edges. That's because the only way I could make a picture to include in a, in a document was to wait till it was dark at night, point a camera at the screen. The computer to display an image like this cost more than $100,000 and had less power than a smartphone. So I'd worked for a few years on this model. I wanted to take a picture and I thought it would be good to share it with others. It was interesting though, the reception I got, people warned me, said, Scott, this is your secret weapon. Keep it to yourself. You'll have a competitive advantage when you're writing grants and that kind of thing. And indeed, keep it to yourself was the view that was pervasive in science at that time. And it still is for many people in many areas. And I have to say, it seemed wrong to me. So when I had access to the World Wide Web after it was developed and launched in 1989, I posted this model of the leg on the web. I had no idea it would be used 30 years later in thousands of studies. This was made possible by what is now called open science, which I didn't know what it was in the past, but I wanted to describe what open science is now. There are some basic principles. First, the principles of open science, it's the practice of science such that others can collaborate, contribute, where software models and data are freely available to everyone. Second, it adopts the principles of inclusion, fairness, equity, and sharing to change the way research is done and who's involved. Third, to make research more open to participation, review, improvement for use and benefit to the world. These are the principles of open science and the ones that I think that we should adopt as the biomechanics community. In 2007, my laboratory launched the OpenSim project as a global communal resource that's now used by tens of thousands of researchers and educators and students worldwide. Now the number of users continues to grow at an accelerating pace. I'm showing here the, the sessions on the OpenSim documentation site. Now I envision OpenSim will continue to grow and expand its reach as research groups around the world adopt it. But I have to say that it's been quite rewarding for me to see this expand beyond my dreams. It's been used for purposes that I, I could have never imagined. And it's in part because OpenSim is useful. It's an application that provides a graphical user interface that enables you to visualize models in vivid detail, make pictures and movies for papers and talks. It's also a library of models. So Matt Demers developed this set of simulations of ankle injury risk. I remember I sat right outside my office. I'd go out there and I'd see him giggling. I'm like, well, Matt, what are you laughing about? He goes, oh, I just blew these ankle ligaments out. You know, of course you need to use simulation to do this. You can't do it in, in experiments. And Matt made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of simulations that are now available to anyone who wants to study ankle ligament injuries. There's also a really beautiful model that, Hank, that Matt made that uh, is available as well. Pat Steele has made really nice simulations available of Crouch Gate, AJ Seth, the shoulder model. This ostrich model was more than a decade in the making. It started when John Hutchinson was a postdoc here, but we didn't publish it until almost 10 years later. There was so much work that went into gathering data for the model, refining it and testing it. So there's this online repository of models that's available to the community. So when you start a new study, you can just go pick a model. If it's applicable to your study, then you can start 10 years in advance of where you would be otherwise. 
One thing I've always wanted to do was done by Carmichael Ong, and that is to simulate impairments and to simulate surgery. So in this first simulation, Carmichael simulated a contracture, a tightening, a shortening of the muscle fibers of the gastrocnemius. He used an optimal controller to predict what the gait would be, and you could see the individual walking on their toes. He then wanted to see, well, what if I went in and performed a gastrocnemius lengthening surgery? What would the gait look like? And here's the gait post-simulated surgery. Now, there's lots of assumptions made here, but these kinds of simulations are quite powerful and can be done in open sim. So what's next? There are two very recent developments. The first is called OpenSense and OpenSense Real-Time. This is wearable, real-time motion sensing. Pat Slade, who led the development, is shown here skateboarding down the street. And we can take OpenSim models, run it on the wearable computer, and get uh, real-time kinematics for a wide variety of motions. This is freely available in the OpenSense and OpenSim software. It's cheap to build. It's about 100 bucks plus $20 times the number of segments to be tracked. It has uh, OpenSim running on the Raspberry Pi, this little wearable computer, and it's all open source and freely available. We recently introduced Open Metabolics, again led by Pat Slade. It's a wearable, real-time metabolic calculator. The system consists of two inertial measurement units connected by a computer, and it provides accurate estimates of metabolic energy consumption. So Delaney is shown here uh, modeling the system as she runs across the Stanford campus. This is just about 400 meters away from where Moybridge did his original experiments. Now, we're motivated to do this because the current methods for estimating energy expenditure have limitations. The two basic ways we do it, almost everyone does this in a laboratory here. Here's my daughter Stella being subject to one of my many experiments where we're measuring her metabolic cost. To do this, we need to be in a laboratory. She wears a gas mask, and over a six minute period, we can estimate her energy expenditure with errors of roughly 3%. This is problematic. You have to come to the lab. You have to wait six minutes for a measurement. So you have to do the activity for six minutes. Much of our activity is actually done by moving around, not in six minute bouts, but in much shorter bouts. Um, wearable smartwatches give you an alternative way to estimate metabolic cost, but they're quite inaccurate. Uh, recent estimates suggest that they're about 40%. So we wanted a, a convenient but accurate way to estimate. And we developed a method. Pat Slade really led this in my laboratory where he had many sensors. And with this many sensor system and a heart rate monitor, you could get errors of only about 11%. Pretty darn good. The exciting finding, however, was that with only two sensors, one on the thigh, one on the shank, there was only 14% error. So this is a real breakthrough that we can get accurate estimates with the wearable device that I just showed you. Could be extremely helpful for individuals um, that need to manage weight, for athletic training where you need to manage your energy. Frequently people will get bone stress injuries because they're not taking in enough calories for what they're burning on their runs. Here we have an accurate way to estimate how much they're burning. So if you look at the errors associated with this, what I'm plotting here is the absolute error for several different methods. In the blue is our wearable system. The errors, as I showed, are around 14%. If you just get heart rate, that's shown in red, and the errors here are on the order of 70%. Smartwatch errors were about 50%. If you did an activity-specific smartwatch, the errors were about 40%. That's where you say, okay, now I'm running, now I'm walking, now I'm climbing stairs. These errors are large enough that for most studies, especially they aren't, they aren't useful. But the new device with two IMUs gives you quite accurate estimates. Now, 
that's steady state error. We also want to be able to estimate energy expenditure during time varying activities. And we can do that quite well. So the wearable system here is shown in blue. And we're tracking interpolated gold standard measurements here. You see it works pretty well. The heart rate monitor doesn't pick up changes. The smartwatch activity um, doesn't really do an accurate job. So these time varying things are pretty nifty. Uh, Kara Welker is shown here wearing the system. So here's her real time estimates of watts as she climbs stairs, as she reaches the top, she's just walking. Her metabolic cost, energy burned, goes down. Now she'll break into a run. Energy cost goes up again, finds her bike, and rides off into the sunset on her bike with lower energy costs. Again, this is all open source, freely available. You can build it yourself, and it's uh, available to all. Now, I want to create tools and motivations for you to share your work. One of them is called SimTK. So it initially was for simulation toolkit, but now it's expanded the scope. There are 1,400 projects that have shared resources. There are over 100,000 users. That's where OpenSim is shared. And if you have things that you want to share, you can go to that website. You can put your data. You can put your models. You can put your simulations. Uh, you can put a description of your new wearable device. And this community will have access to that. I'm also keen to share tools for teaching. And that's what we've done at biomech.stanford.edu. These videos, uh, tools for teachers, homework problems, slides, cool demos. I really want people to join up. Uh, it's free to join, and you can have access to all these materials. And what I hope is that you share your materials, cool applications you're doing in your class. If you're a student, a project that you're doing, you can freely upload it. And I'm sure other students around the world will be super interested in, in your projects as well. So what are the key messages here? First, biomechanics will advance society most effectively if we work together as an open scientific community. Second, my lab will continue to provide open source tools for research and teaching, and we encourage you to join that as well. Engage with the community, share your tools. That's the way to maximize the impact of your research. So those are my four stories. We've talked about personalizing biomechanics for osteoarthritis, democratizing access, biomechanics at planetary scale, and engaging in biomechanics as an open science worldwide collaboration. I wanted to close now with some just personal reflections on the field.